Good morning and welcome to Sunday School at First Baptist Church this morning. I am so glad that you are joining us. Um, we are in Lesson 7 of The Remarkable Journey um, and we are going to continue on in our study of Mark. Before we begin our lesson today, let's pause for a moment of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we are able to gather and study your word. Um, help us to read your word today and to take from it what we can use in our lives so that we may grow and become more like you in all that we say and that we do. Um, help us to find ourselves in your scripture in a way that helps us to continue to be more Christ-like each day. Um, because, Lord, that is our desire. We pray for those in our community who are sick or who are grieving at this time, and we ask that your presence be with them. Help us to know how we best can minister to them. In your son's most precious and holy name, amen. All right, as I said, we are in lesson seven, which is called Friends in Low Places. Um, I got a little bit of a giggle out of it referencing a Garth Brooks song. So, today's lesson is Mark chapter 2, verses 13 through 17, and I'm going to read those aloud now. Um, all right. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him, and Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law who were Pharisees saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Okay, so we are into the study of Mark, and this lesson comes immediately after the lesson where Jesus is healing someone and is equating um, in some ways sickness with sin and healing with restoration and repentance. So, and that's more to show that Jesus has the power not only to heal physical needs, but spiritual needs as well. And this lesson, this story connects to the one before it in that there's a shift happening it's moving beyond a willingness to forgive to Jesus being active in pursuit of those who need forgiveness. So Jesus isn't just willing to forgive people. He's willing to go out and meet them where they are to seek them out in order to offer them forgiveness. So this is a pretty big shift from last week's lesson where someone is brought to Jesus. Jesus is going to them. Now, we're going to get into this and break this down verse by verse and talk about it. But before I do that, I want to point out that there's a little bit of a pattern that's going on here. And it's going to carry on over the lessons for the next several weeks. And I think it's really helpful when you can see these structures in the writing that's taking place. So we're, this is the second of five conflict events between Jesus, his disciples, and the Jewish authorities. And they start last week, and they're going to continue on through Mark chapter 3, verse 6. So these passages all have an outline in common. There's an event. There's the point of conflict. Then there's an accusation brought against Jesus, and then the response of Jesus. So we want to look for those four things throughout 
each of these stories, which will help us understand more about what's going on and help us see the structure that's here. So an event, the point of conflict, an accusation brought against Jesus, and then the response of Jesus. So let's start with the event. So Matthew, we need to start with who Matthew is when, for us to understand this event. Matthew is a tax collector who is also called Levi. Now, we can't prove this. We don't know for sure. But often at this time, people who were called Levi were descended from the priestly line. So they would have been someone who could have been working in the temple. Matthew, we find out, is a tax collector, which is the most hated profession that there is in biblical times. Because tax collectors were not just like IRS agents. No. Tax collectors were seen as traitors because they, the Jews of that time, would have seen them as serving Rome instead of serving their countrymen. So, one, they're helping Rome to profit and working on the side of the oppressor rather than the oppressed. On top of that, the way they made their money was by um, adding to the fees that they collected for Rome and lining their own pockets with that. So they were seen as dishonest and traitors and all this. Now, you take that reputation of a tax collector and you apply it to someone who, if, if they were part of the priestly line and could have been working in the temple, they would have seen that as even more of a betrayal than anyone else doing it. So Matthew would have been, or Levi, whichever one you want to call him by, um, would have been despised by the people in the community. Now, Jesus is back at the lake, which is probably the Sea of Galilee. And we are also, just so we're clear, this is referenced in Luke as well and in Matthew. So we have various scriptures to draw from to get a full picture of this story. So, and this was a major crossroads in the area. And so travel between these areas um, would have happened, but part of Matthew's job would have been to collect a toll um, as part of the traveling back and forth. And with him being near the Sea of Galilee, he probably knew the disciples that Jesus had already called because Jesus had just previously called Simon, Andrew, James, and John, who are fishermen. And so if Matthew is a tax collector near the Sea of Galilee, um, Simon, Andrew, James, and John probably knew him. And this was probably not Matthew's first encounter with Jesus either. Um, it tells us in scripture that the tax collectors and sinners in the passage we just read, that many of them followed Jesus. So there was a group of these people who were following Jesus and learning from him. And so it's interesting that Jesus then turns to Matthew and says, follow me. The other thing that's a little different here because there's some pretty big differences between Jesus calling Matthew to follow him and when he called Simon and Andrew, James, and John. When he called the first group, it was private. Jesus wasn't really as well known yet. But this time when he's calling Matthew, he has a crowd gathered and he's been teaching and this was a very public event. And so Matthew was basically asked like in front of the whole church, hey, are you going to do this? And he immediately got up and followed. The other big difference between these two groups is that when Jesus called Simon, Andrew, James, and John, when he called them, they were fishermen. They could go back to commercial fishing later, and they did, but they could go back to their employment. They could go back to their job. Were they giving things up? Absolutely. I'm not making light of their sacrifice. But when Matthew gave up his job, that's not something he could go back to. 
he abandoned his post as a tax collector. He was not going to get rehired for that. So when he gave that up, when he immediately went to follow Jesus, he gave up everything. So that was a huge statement, and he did it instantaneously. So let's keep moving now that we've got a little bit of background there and we're a little bit more understanding of Matthew, his situation, his reputation in the community, and what's happening there. So, um, Matthew was a tax collector, and one day Jesus came by, and he called Matthew and said, follow me, and Matthew did. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. Matthew, being a tax collector sitting at the toll booth, um, being despised by the people around him, probably did not see other people at their best. People were probably rude and um, angry with him, even hostile, um, and maybe rightfully so, but they would have treated him poorly. And here comes Jesus and says, follow me. N.T. Wright, um, when he's looking at this and talking about it, he says that it was perhaps the first time for ages that someone had treated him as a human being instead of a piece of dirt. So Jesus not just called Matthew to be one of his disciples, but Jesus also treated him with respect and kindness and um, sort of helped restore his humanity in some ways. Um, so in Luke, it talks about how Matthew left everything behind and got up and began to follow him and how his commitment would have cost him his job and everything else. Um, so this reason that he got up and followed right away is one of the reasons that we sort of think that Matthew had probably been following Jesus from a distance or learning about him, had probably seen him heal people and do different things um, because him getting up and leaving everything for a complete and total stranger seemed a little unlikely. Um, so in leaving everything to follow Jesus though, there was stuff that Matthew definitely gained. Um, there was a trade involved here. Um, and some of the things he got was he would have gotten clean hands. He would no longer be cheating people in order to make his living. He would be able to have a clear conscience. Um, he lost his job, but he gained a much bigger task. Um, he, some people would say that he left everything except for his pen. Um, with his orderly mind and his systematic way of working and his familiarity with the pen, Matthew was the first man to give the world a book on the teachings of Jesus. And then he gained immortal and worldwide fame. If Matthew had declined Jesus' invitation to follow him, he would have been known as someone who lived well at the expense of others. Um, and today he's known as the one who gave us the words of Jesus. So the event here in this passage is Jesus calling Matthew to follow him. And then we move on to that point of conflict. So the dinner party that occurs next. So in it seems as if in celebration of him following Jesus, that he holds a dinner party where Jesus was very likely the guest of honor. And who does Matthew invite to the dinner party? Of course, tax collectors and sinners, along with Jesus and his disciples. Now, this is one of the points where I find it interesting because if you look back at the scripture, it says um, in verse 15, while Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. So this is how we know that there were many tax collectors and sinners 
who followed Jesus. Um, and so what that's telling us is that it wasn't unusual for Jesus to be in the presence of tax collectors and sinners. Um, there was something about them that longed to be near Jesus. And it was probably the kindness and mercy that he showed. Um, so these two groups of people, we've talked about the role of the tax collector and what that means. Now we need to look at who are the, who's this other group, the sinners? Well, there are two groups of people who could have been classified as sinners. One are people living with morals that pretty much everybody would have agreed were not appropriate. Um, so it would identify people who broke a moral law. But it also included, the term sinners would also include people who did not obey and observe the scribal law or the law of Moses. Now, the Pharisees are about to enter the scene. And the Pharisees, I got to tell you, I know they get a lot wrong, but I kind of liked how their minds worked because it's sort of what you do with children. The Pharisees held to the law, but they didn't just hold to the law written. They held to the law that was spoken as well. And they spent time studying the law and interpreting the law. And so for the Pharisees, it was just as important to follow every letter of the law. So what the Pharisees did was they created what we often refer to as the fence around the law. And the idea here is that if I draw a line, I'm going to draw it and hold it up. And you can't see it because my thing's pink. Let me get a darker marker. There we go. That'll work. If I draw a line and I say, I don't want you to cross this line, and you, if you're right here and I say, I don't want you to cross this line, this is the line that you cannot cross. What I'm going to do to keep you from crossing that line is I'm going to put a fence up. And I'm going to say, hey, don't go past this fence. And guess what? If you don't go past that fence, there's no way you can get across that line. And that's what the Pharisees did. It's sort of that concept of if I put enough barriers in place, there's no way that I can actually break the law because it would take too much effort. And so with kids, you, you do this. I know where my limit is with kids and their volume, for instance. And so the trick is to sort of stop it before it ever gets to the point where it's really getting on my nerves. That way, we just never get to that place. Wherever my boundary really is, I back it up a little bit. Sort of like those people who are always late or whatever you invite them to, and you tell them to show up 15 minutes early. Do you really want them there 15 minutes early? No, but you know that by telling them that, you'll get them there on time. This is what the Pharisees did. So, is it the right thing to do? Not necessarily. The Pharisees did it in such a way that by the time the Pharisees were done, the only people who weren't sinners were the Pharisees. By the Pharisees' definition of sinners, even Jesus and his disciples would have been sinners. Because were they keeping all of the fences that the Pharisees put up in place of the law and to protect people from breaking the law? Were they obeying all of those? By eating with these sinners and tax collectors, they weren't. So this is where this comes in. The Pharisees were so concerned with maintaining the law that they didn't want to risk at all breaking it. So they believed that this was so important that to eat with people who had no regard for the law or with low morals as they saw it was a way that Jesus was saying that he accepted them and befriended them. 
and to them this was completely out of bounds. Um, so that is the point of conflict, is that Jesus is having this meal with the sinners and the tax collectors. And sharing a meal is a big deal. Most people at this time would only share meals with people of equal social standing. Um, Pharisees wouldn't typically even eat in the home of the average Jewish person because they would be afraid that some minor law would be broken in preparation of the food. Um, and so they weren't willing to take that risk even. So next comes the accusation that Jesus is associating with the wrong people. And this isn't really a surprise because this is who Jesus was spending time with. Um, but the Pharisees' response to this was also not a surprise, but it's based on contempt and fear. You see, the Pharisees looked down on the common person. And Jesus loved them. The Jewish authorities stood above them and looked down on them as sinners. And Jesus came and sat beside them. And by sitting beside them, lifted them up and restored them. And so the Pharisees had a lot of contempt for that because Jesus was responding in a way that was so different. Than what they would do. And that contempt was compounded by fear. The Pharisees lived in constant fear that they would come in contact with a sinner and then be infected with sin and uncleanness. So it was almost as if for the Pharisees, sin was like the COVID-19 of the time day. They didn't want anything to do with it. They wanted to be so far away from it. Um, and Jesus was the one who forgot himself in the desire to heal others. Jesus was the one who healed lepers, um, which was not a thing that the Pharisees would have even thought about doing. So accusation here that they make to the disciples, that the disciples either bring to Jesus or that Jesus overhears is, why is he eating with the sinners and the tax collectors? But Jesus answered. Jesus came to them and said, um, he didn't view these guests as untouchables or rejects in any way. He considered them patients who needed a physician. Um, Mark has already compared sin to sickness and forgiveness as having one's health restored. Jesus was that physician. And so, in this, we can see that Jesus can be compared to a physician. He comes to us in our need. He makes the correct diagnosis. He provides the correct treatment and cure, and then he pays the bill. I mean, who wouldn't love that kind of physician? And so when Jesus responds to the Pharisees, you know it's building more and more the tension between the Pharisees and Jesus and his disciples. Um, and we're going to see this continue in the next several um, encounters. But in Matthew's account of this same event, um, it tells us that Jesus quoted Hosea 6.6 6 to the Jewish authorities. Um, I desire compassion and not sacrifice. And the Pharisees were so intent on keeping their rituals that they neglected to extend mercy to those who need it the most. And so the background of Hosea's words here that Jesus is using um, is really revealing because the prophecy of Hosea addresses spiritual adultery or prostitution. The emphasis here is really obvious. God is wounded by the unfaithfulness of his people. And so we look at this and we see that the Pharisees are so focused on righteousness. 
But is it really righteousness or is it self-righteousness? Is it really about um, trying to live up to God's standards or is it about putting yourself on a pedestal and showing being the contrast to what others are doing? Is it, is it really, can we, I guess Jesus is really calling them out here in that, you know, your righteousness, it says this in scripture that our righteousness is like filthy rags. And so our righteousness, what we attempt to do is nothing compared to what God can do. And so in all of their righteousness or self-righteousness, as I like to think of it, um, they're missing the point of God's mercy and reaching out to those who are most in need. And so um, in some of the commentaries, one of the people said that Jesus spoke these words to the very ones who claimed to understand the teaching of the prophets This out of Hosea. Um, and so G. Campbell Morgan um, recreates the conversation Jesus had with the scribes and Pharisees, and he says it, it would go like this. Go and learn what this meaneth. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Go and learn what is what the heart of God is. Go and find out that according to your own writings, God is far more anxious to have mercy than he is to receive any offering that a man brings to him. When you have learned this, then you will understand why I sit down with the publicans and sinners, why I recline and eat in the midst of them. So there's another point in this lesson that I want to bring out. We've talked about the Pharisees extensively. We've talked about who Matthew was quite a bit. And we've even talked about the sinners and the tax collectors and Jesus's role in all of this. But I also want to talk about Matthew in a little bit of a different way. Jesus called Matthew to be one of his disciples. And this was a surprising choice. It's not who anyone would have chosen or picked. <coughs> And often I think that we don't see ourselves as being worthy of being called by God to do big tasks or to do important things. We often forget that Jesus called and that God called ordinary people to do extraordinary things. And that when God uses these ordinary people, it's because we are it allows God's glory to be shown. <clears throat> if I do what I can do in my own strength and in my own abilities, that's not showing off God. It's when God takes someone who's ordinary and elevates them and puts them in a place where they can do great things that we can see that God is at work. Um, one of my favorite examples of this is Billy Graham. Look at his humble beginning and what he was able to accomplish over the course of his life. Um, and all of that was because he was obedient to God and God was able to use him in big and powerful and wonderful ways. Um, one of the quotes that I saw early on, um, and I remember I had it on my wall while I was in college, because I had already experienced God's call on my life, but I was still sifting through what that meant. And it was that God quali God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. And that it's not so much about what you bring to the table. What God asks of us is that we bring a willingness to serve and that God will qualify us to do what he has called us to do. Um, and so it's the willing heart that God is looking for. So I don't know what God is calling you to do in this moment, but also understand that calling is about, I think of it a lot like marriage, which is really funny since I'm not married, but marriage is not a decision that you make one time, one day, and that solves everything. No, you have to choose to be committed to that marriage every day. 
And the same is true with God and his calling on our lives. We have to choose to be obedient and available to God every day. It's not a one and done situation. Oh, God called me that one time and here I am. No, it's more than that. Um, you can't have a big moment, just like a wedding is a big moment, but it moves beyond that. And it's about the choice you make to remain available and willing and committed to serving. And so while we're in this time period where we're not gathering together in person, I think it's a great time to reevaluate um, God's calling on our lives and what God's calling us to do in this season of our life. How are we serving and contributing to helping others um, know Christ? And one of the things that the teachers quarterly brought up was that we've got to be careful in this, that we are not being Pharisees and putting up fences that keep other people away from hearing the invitation of Jesus. Because one of the things that this banquet is symbolizing is the banquet that we will experience one day um, with Jesus in heaven where everyone is gathered. That all who have followed Christ are there. And it will be a wide variety of people. But Jesus' invitation is to everyone, it's to the sinners, it's to the tax collectors, it's to the Pharisees, it's to anyone who will accept. And so we have to be careful that we're not putting barriers up to who is allowed to hear the invitation. Um, it's easy for us to exclude others or for us to expect them to get certain things in order before they encounter Christ. And we know that that's not how that really works. Um, Jesus does not come to us with a checklist of things we have to have accomplished before he's willing to accept us. And so we have to be careful that we don't impose that on other people. So I want to challenge you in this time to continue to explore God's calling on your life, to, to seek him in prayer and to listen to what he may be calling you to do and to possibly find new avenues of ways to serve him. Um, one of my favorite quotes, and I can't remember who said it right now. I'm gonna have to go back and look. Oh, it's gonna bother me that I don't know. But anyway, the gist of it was that calling is about um, your passion being the world's greatest needs. So what are you passionate about? passionate about and how can that meet the needs of the world um, and so I think that is something that we can hold on to is looking at what we're passionate about what we love to do and how that can be used to further God's kingdom and um, that's it for today I appreciate you um, joining me for Sunday school. I hope you will tune in for our live stream service um, as we continue our study of the windows in the sanctuary. It will be great to worship with you virtually and um, stay safe out there. Before we go, let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that we can study your word. But thank you most of all that Jesus loved the tax collectors and the sinners, that he loved them enough to come here and to eat meals with them and to teach them and to love them. But God, most importantly, that he loved them enough to die on the cross. Because God, if we really pay attention, if we really study your word, we realize that we are all the tax collectors and the sinners desperately in need of the Savior. Help us to tear down fences that keep people away from accepting the invitation that you've extended to them. Help us to be your hands and feet, welcoming them to the banquet. Help us to listen for your call on our lives and to be willing and humble enough to accept and serve in the way that you've called us. 
Thank you so much for the great love that you've extended to us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, I hope you have a wonderful week. And check us out at the live stream service. Thanks. Bye.